Uh, so firstly, we'd warmly like to welcome you to the Rethinking Museum webinar series hosted by the Embassy of France in Sri Lanka and Maldives and Alliance Frances together with Artra Magazine, Derry Artra, Morning Branch and AOD. Thank you for joining us. And today we explore the topic, considering museum sustainability, a timely one given the staggering environmental realities brought about at the recently concluded United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, very rivetingly highlighting how the cuts in global greenhouse gas emissions and carbon footprints being considerably away from where they need to be. I personally found the motive and objective outcry of the British naturalist, Sir David Attenborough, significant for not only reflecting upon the environmental stability that we all depend on breaking, but also for highlighting that we still have the capacity to fix this unfortunate situation that we behold through responsible actions. Thus, this topic of considering museum sustainability is monumental in its exploration of determining the manner through which conservation can be compatible with sustainability. In dissecting this topic, we have revered speakers today who will present their own perspective to this subject matter through their own professional practice in a timely presentation, after which we will have a Q&A session. So we invite you, the audience, to pose your questions. You may write them during the course of the presentations and they will be answered once all presentations have been completed. So to begin the conversation, let me start off by introducing the speakers. And firstly, we, we have Shai De Silva, who is an architect whose practice focuses on curatorial and editorial projects. She joined the Jeffrey Bauer Trust in 2018, where she manages the Jeffrey Bauer collections, including the programs around exhibitions, publication, and conservation. Shari curated the year-long Bava 100 Centenary Celebration Program, which was launched in July 2019, and is currently working on the forthcoming exhibition. It is essential to be there, drawing from the Jeffrey Bava archive and accompanying publication of the same title. Secondly, we have Sunal Jawadana, revered environmental architect and conservationist, who is hailed in Sri Lanka and overseas for invaluable contribution to sustainable practices. Sunila, in fact, approaches architecture as an applied form of art, of which her overarching creative influence is by and large of environmental innovation, exploring the ecology of sites and sustainability of human habitats. She was the first chairperson of the Federation of Environmental Organizations of Sri Lanka and was recognized as Sri Lanka's leading environmental architect by the Time Magazine in 2007. Thirdly, we have Kinga Gray, who is an esteemed curator and project manager at the Home Museum in Paris, who also has 10 years of experience as a cinegrapher, responsible for traveling exhibitions at the National Museum of Natural History in Paris. The culmination of her multifaceted professional experience has led her in conceptualizing and implementing actions in favor of the circular economy in temporary exhibitions. Fourthly, we have Shani Pereira, who is a strategic advisor to AOD, one of Sri Lanka's leading design schools, BA programs team. She curates and facilitates innovative approaches to the pedagogy of AOD. Her main focus with these efforts is to develop and encourage multidisciplinary approaches among young designers in appreciation of local and global design, craft, and art practices. And finally, we have Inez Roj, who has been working on the crossroads of art and ecology for the past 10 years. She holds a degree in international cooperation and at the Simon Bolivar and in University in Ecuador. Inez Roche also graduated with a master's degree in curating from the Leipzig School of Fine Arts with honors for a final project on the curator, a diplomat in the era of ecological conflicts and attempt to compose the world through curatorial practice. She is currently in charge of international development for AVER Archive of Women Artists Research and Exhibition, and is also involved in energy transition issues with the think tank, The Shift Project, where she initiated a study on the curatorial sector. And now the presentations will begin, and over to you, Shari. Thank you so much, Azara, for the introduction and for Aurelia to, for inviting us on this panel, which I agree is a very important um, topic and certainly something that's at the forefront of what we're trying to engage with at uh, Jeffrey Power Trust. 
just going to share my screen. You can see my screen. Um, so the Jeffrey Bauer Trust was established in 1983 by the late architect. And our mandate is to foster and further the arts, architecture, and the environmental and ecological uh, sciences in Sri Lanka and, and further afield. And this work was really begun during the architect's own lifetime with the establishment of travel grants, artist residencies, and scholarships. Following the architect's death in 2003, um, the trust uh, initiated an annual memorial lecture and a triennial awards program to further this work. Um, in addition, uh, the trust manages the estate of the late architect, which includes the gardens Lunaganga, which we'll look at closely soon. And in the gardens, there are, as part of that plan, there are two islands with um, there was also a project where the trust working with the wildlife department has begun uh, to, to study and protect a uh, native species of deer called the hog deer. I, as, um, through Azara's introduction, my field is really architecture and art history. And I joined the trust in 2018, uh, where the following year, 2019, would celebrate the architect's 100th birthday. And with this program, we, we did a year long program of talks, tours and exhibitions that was really beginning to look at our collections, our work as a museum, which until then had not really been institutionalized. Um, and with that work, we also began to look at what our goals were, what our values were, and how we further the mandate that was given to us by the architect. A key document for us has been the 17 sustainability development goals by the UN, which have also been adop adopted by ICOM in uh, 2019. And these goals are very much interrelated. And I think the reason ICOM thought they were very important to be a uh, standard for all museums is that um, everything we do from exhibitions to programming uh, involves a massive ecological, social, uh, political, economical, there's a massive impact. Um, Bauer's own work, which we look to often as we develop our programs, did have to reckon with these forces of um, ecology, environment, um, political and economical limitations, not unlike what we're facing in Sri Lanka at the moment. And in fact, some of his most prolific years in his 40 or more than 40 um, year career in what were in the 60s and 70s, where Sri Lanka uh, had a closed economy and there was an incredible limit on uh, the kind of materials and um, techniques and resources that were available to the architect. Um, here you see the incredible batik ceiling re, uh, recently reinstalled by Ina de Silva at the Mentita Beach Hotel, a resort, a pioneering resort uh, that was designed and completed in the late 1960s. And in this project, as with many of Bauer's works, you see a lifelong collaboration with people like Ina de Silva, Barbara Sansoni, both who worked with communities of women in rural Sri Lanka to create um, art and furnishing objects, uh, as well as this lifelong collaboration with Lucky Sanenaika, who was um, deeply committed to environmental um, conservation in Sri Lanka. I'm now going to turn to some of the more recent works and how we are trying to further that ethos in the work that we're doing. So as part of that centenary celebration that I mentioned, we um, installed, we had a series of five installations by artists and architects, both from Sri Lanka and overseas that we invited to respond to the Garden of Lenukaka. And this program was called The Gift. All artists had an established connection with uh, the garden and the architect's work, either through visits or through citing him as somebody who had been inspirational to their practice. And two projects that I'm going to just look at, uh, although with all five of these projects, they ended up being local. They were um, projects that we developed very much with the artists. So there was quite a loose brief, which was to engage with the garden make this work in celebration of this practice. 
And here we see King of Kuma's Kitul Ami Pavilion um, on its opening day. This uh, Sakuma, as you all know, is a Japanese architect who, whose practice is very sensitive to materials, um, especially those that can be found um, locally to the sites which, within which he works. And it was an idea that started with a simple sketch, um, then took on a parametric dimension and he would develop it um, you know, in Tokyo using the technologies that his practice is familiar with. And then it had to, we had to figure out how do we make this in Sri Lanka, where um, we worked with, this is Vishnu Shiromali, who was the lead uh, crafts person, who really the, and her team wove this entire cuticle surface. And this, we, this project really kind of celebrated the work that Bawa himself did, which was to look at how do you make things with what's available. Um, it's a project that isn't meant to last forever. And, and Kikuma was very um, specific that once the Kitu disintegrates and the pavilion is dismantled. Um, and for us, it was a way of working with somebody who's used to working in museums across the world um, to use design as a driver to figure out what is possible in a local context. The second project from this series of five installations that I'd like to look at is Zephyrus's Breath, a sonic work by Taiwanese artist Li Mingwei, whose works are often about intimacy and encounter. When Mingwei was originally invited to work with us, he suggested he brings uh, a similar structure of um, a circle of 50 bells that he had installed in Scotland as a part uh, of, a, of a work called Trilogy of Sounds. It was one of three pieces in that series. Um, and very, there were big copper bells that he had done in Scotland. And very quickly we realized um, actually there was no way in which we could bring these works without using our entire installation budget um, to bring the works in Scotland. And also that in terms of scales, uh, Lunaganga doesn't have the kind of giant fir trees that were um, in his, at his site in Scotland. So what we ended up doing was to work with the artists to make these bells within Sri Lanka using precast brass uh, tubes. And this process also allowed us to make something that responded to Sri Lanka. The brass bells actually have a timber that's very akin to temple bells in Sri Lanka. And Lunuganga itself is a garden that has 14 bells scattered through it. And with these projects, um, we didn't, sustainability was important to us, but also feasibility was important to us and budget was important to us. And it was really something that we worked with the artists. And in that process, we're trying to figure out how do we make sure we're not spend, we're not, it's not that we're not having a ridiculous shipping, uh, a carbon footprint through shipping things across the world. And how do we make these in Sri Lanka? And this um, whole project happened in, was being planned during the, the, right in the aftermath of the Easter bombings in Sri Lanka. So we were also very aware of the constraints. And of course, um, when you look at the conversations around sustainability in museums, they are often about how do you limit your, your footprint? How do you um, limit the kind of traveling, uh, how, when, it, when an exhibition travels, what materials do you import? And these ideas have been very, very important to us even as we continue. So our next project, which is opening on February 1st, it's an exhibition on drawings from the archive. We're very excited because it's the first time these drawings have really been shown in person anywhere. And actually it's the first time that um, Bauer's work has been shown in a comprehensive way in Sri Lanka, even though there have been multiple exhibitions on his work in the UK, the USA, Australia, India, Brazil. But again, we were faced with works in paper and archival works in paper, of course, incredibly delicate and incredibly sensitive to changes in temperature, changes in climate. And we had to work a way of framing these in a way that doesn't damage the works themselves. Um, initially, we had hoped that we would be able to in import the basic archival framing materials. But of course, the changes that we've seen in Sri Lanka meant that those caught, that's become financially and logistically impossible in Sri Lanka um, at present. 
And so what we've done is we have worked with Udaya Hebevarsen, who uh, is a conservator, a, mod, a contemporary art conservator we work with very closely. Also, you can see in this image, my colleague, Christopher Silva. Um, we've worked to create a framing system that basically will seal these objects from the outside environment. Um, but using materials that we've created, so we have learned, we've had to figure out how to create a mount that was low acidity and um, by, by creating it ourselves. And I, I don't want to go too much into the details because um, this will also now be part of the work we'll talk about when we open the show. But essentially we've, partly through just having to do it um, and partly through a lack of resources, We've found a way that we can show these works in a way that is acceptable in an international museum standard, but that is also using local materials. Um, yeah, may I ask? I believe you're not in the just... Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so these are two, two instances in our recent work that we've had to um, address issues that are aligned with the sustainability goals. Um, but we also, what we hope is that using the experiences of the last three years and then our projected um, pr our projects for the next three years that we are able to identify actionable um, sustainability goals so that we can develop a more systematic policy that then we can actually adhere to um, that is aware that is responsive to our particular situation, which I think is limited in many ways, is very, um, is always in flux, uh, kind of um, the logistics of running a museum in Sri Lanka um, involve being able to respond to constant changes. Um, but we also, in addition to the, to the kind of large uh, project-based efforts that we're taking, um, we are trying in just our more kind of mundane day-to-day -day activities. For example, um, when we have uh, merchandise that are about, you know, creating to take this brand across um, to new audiences across across the ocean, and when even when we produce items like that, we're trying very hard to work with small businesses that do have a sustainable goal in their practices um, to produce those items, and we think very deeply, um, and I'm very fortunate to work with a team of, um, a young team that is personally committed to these goals. And so everything from how we think about packaging, how we reuse um, packing items, if objects are moving from one place to another. Um, so we try to also make sure that it's, it's not just the big projects and the kind of headliner efforts, but our day-to-day -day activities. Um, we'd really try to limit museum with the, uh, printing within the museum. Um, and we try to make sure that, so I think when we do come up with that policy, there will, it will be tiered at large scale goals and then very simple actions that we hope everyone will adopt. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Shari, for sharing the vision of Jeffrey ba of the Jeffrey Bauer Trust. And I must also add uh, the element of the virtual experience that you all have been uh, very strongly uh, communicating to the audience with the with uh, you know some of your architectural talks to uh, the curation of the art at the spaces have also contributed to a newer way of accessibility and at the same time um, a sustainable means. Uh, by and large in conservation as well. So um, yes, uh, that was insightful. So going forward, we have Sunela who will be presenting her uh, perspective. Over to you, Sunela. Uh, Sunela, I think you're on mute. Yeah, unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. All right. So thank you, Aurelia, for inviting me on board. And uh, yes, mine is a, a perspective. Let's let's see whether I can share my screen. Um, 
um, Um, can you see the screen? Um, yeah. Can you see, uh, see the screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let me see this. Uh, up into that. Um, into that. Okay. Um, have I left the thing at all? No. Um, it's not sharing for some like. Yeah, uh, we can see your profile picture only. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. This is happening. Can you see it now? No. No, not yet. Hmm. Okay. Um. Yes. Ah, yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> right. Sorry. Sorry about that. I know what was going on. Okay. So, um, yes. Uh, I've uh, actually um, in my practice I've. Uh, focus on environmental design because I think uh, it's uh, environment is my greatest passion. Um, and I've always seen architecture as a tool to um, try and uh, try and uh, conserve uh, environments. And, um, you know, uh, when I started this practice uh, 30 years ago, this wasn't really um, as cool as it is today. Uh, so I think um, from being uh, an, uh, very much on the periphery of uh, architectural thinking, uh, environmental design has now become, uh, um, you know, come right into the center of human existence. Uh, so that's where we are at today. And then when Aurelia asked me to speak on uh, museums, I started looking this up and uh, as uh, much as I am a museum buff, you can't keep me out of museums uh, if I travel. Uh, um, I love museums. And, um, but I do understand where they're at. Um, reading uh, and researching uh, the subject for this talk, I um, came about this, uh, that museums are the servants of our planet's shared memory. And this is so true because um, I think um, traditionally uh, museums uh, very often began with uh, private collections, uh, colonial looting, uh, which then uh, was kept in private collections, which then were built up into national uh, um, presentations. Um, uh, so that's, uh, yes, it is a, a collective memory of humanity uh, sometimes even a reluctant uh, a membership of a collective, but that's what they are. And traditionally our museums, which, you know, the greatest museums in the world, you uh, get the Metropolitan Museum, New York, you have the Louvre, uh, you have the British Museum and everyone in the world has heard about it. I've heard about these three museums. Um, so many more, there is the St. Petersburg Museum, which is uh, old, older than, uh, uh, definitely older than the Met and uh, about, I think about the age of the Louvre, um, uh, there's Prada in uh, Spain, there are so many fabulous museums. And um, when you look at them, um, they're pretty old, they're really old. Uh, and uh, uh, 
And then you look at the size of these museums uh, and you're looking at massive, massive uh, spaces. Um, and you, you're looking at these collections, which are uh, really, really um, uh, astounding. Now, um, the problem with these collections, of, of course, you know, you're not going to see all these pieces. Uh, there must be vast stocks uh, uh, in storage, which might never uh, see the light of day, but, um, you know, some, there's a huge percentage which is uh, stored there. And uh, then there is the public um, uh, display, which traditionally has been in this kind of space where you're looking at um, um, HVAC or heat uh, ventilation and air conditioning for both the items on display and uh, for the public who are viewing them. And um, I think that's, um, what the standard is today. So uh, besides, besides the large part that's in storage, you're looking at um, this portion, whatever, whatever percentage that a museum uh, decides to exhibit to the public. Um, you're talking of, uh, of a huge energy consumption and that's, that's where this problem is. Um, so if, if, you, if you look at um, the, the what what a museum consumes you have energy uh, which is light uh, heating and air conditioning you have water which is uh, you know the consumption um, whatever your public uh, usage you have your administrative usage you have the gray water disposal and then you have the material which is also very important particularly in in the building of new museums uh, what kind of material is being used? Are uh, these um, materials which are environmentally accepted by today's standards? And what then is the application that what kind of process is being used to construct these museums? Um, so um, now this is of great concern because um, what is happening very sadly is that even the new museums, which are being built, uh, what, some 250 uh, uh, years later, um, they are still, uh, the footprints are massive. The uh, number of exhibits, the collections, the permanent collections are huge. So if you take the National Museum of China, um, Beijing, I don't know how many times one has to visit to be able to see the entire permanent collection. Right, you're, you're uh, looking at uh, some crazy numbers. You're, you're looking at um, the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, which is, uh, just opened last year, and you're talking of 41,000 uh, square meters. Um, you're talking of a museum in Oslo, uh, the National Museum in Oslo, which is opening next year, and you're talking of an even bigger space, so 5,000 exhibits. Now you might say 5,000 exhibits of which maybe 50 stay in your head, right? Um, so my, my question then is, um, can we afford this today? Uh, can, uh, because uh, isn't it time that we reconsider this? And I think that's the whole purpose of this exhibition, right? Uh, of this discussion, uh, considering sustainability. Um, I mean, in my mind, there's no doubt we have to consider sustainability. Uh, but um, what is being looked at here? Um, yeah, we, what has changed from uh, when the British Museum was built, from when the Louvre was built, uh, from when the Met was built uh, 100 years after the Louvre and the um, British Museum? Are we looking at alternate exhibition methods? Uh, limited HVAC exhibits so that maybe the, um, you know, the, some of the um, exhibitions, are, um, uh, you know, uh, you sort of cycle it in a way that uh, only, um, you know, something is uh, light and heating triggers with a certain crowd or accessibility that traffic management, uh, you know, where you uh, 
certain galleries open only during certain hours because you know if you go to a museum you you don't look at everything i mean i i come out feeling dizzy uh because of, uh i'm one of those people who uh believes i have to see everything and then you know i i can't uh, knowing that nothing you know, you know what small percentage actually goes into my head i'm still you know uh, um can't help myself i'll try to uh wade through everything so uh, are we talking about limited galleries um, where people can, you know, actually choose the days and what they want to see? Are we talking about a limited access uh, for research only? Uh, are we talking about maximizing digital access? And what are we doing about maximizing natural light and ventilation? Now, some of this is happening um, on a, on a uh, I'd say, still say a small scale because these are the smaller museums um, uh, for instance, if you take the visitor center at a tiny little uh, um, visitor center in uh, Bambula, which um, I think it's contextually quite correct because you are talking about a megalithic uh, cemetery and somehow it doesn't have, if you take, uh, for instance, which is just a copy of this uh, 4,000 year old uh, carnelian bead necklace, if you had the original there, you could you'd have probably have to have this highly um, controlled uh, exhibition uh, space, but because it's a copy, which is good enough, in my opinion, unless, unless you're a researcher, you are an academic, you wouldn't know the difference. Um, you could have it in this context, because this, in, in a way, uh, it, it uh, is, if you look at this, it's a better um, um, it, relationship to its um, original uh, time than say to uh, a very bland uh, panel box, which is, uh, you, know, you know, paying for its uh, lighting and for its uh, air conditioning. Um, the public in, in Sri Lankan climates can walk outside, which is far better than being in a air conditioned space again. Um, if you, uh, this is, um, um, this is a visit center again, which I was very struck by um, when I visited because of the low lines um, and the very minimal um, imposition on this particular landscape, which, uh, you know, anything else would have eclipsed the whole, um, the whole uh, sense of, uh, you know, an ancient site, but these very minimal lines and uh, then more so the way, uh, the public spaces were um, were presented. Um, so the, these are, in my opinion, these are the museums um, that are moving forward. Um, this is the Mona in in uh, Tasmania again, small private museum with a very uh, limited um, enclosed public area, which I, I again is where we should be going. Um, Talking of bigger museums, this is uh, the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, and where um, you know the in the United Arab Emirates, um, the building uh, um, far more um, spacious than all the tiny museums I just showed you in uh, Volubilis in uh, in uh, Tasmania and certainly Sri Lanka. Um, they can certainly afford it, and um, here's uh, an architect um, uh, who's uh, thinking about these spaces, thinking about creating, um, uh, I think uh, here uh, is a public space uh, covered by this metal dome, which is um, actually quite fantastic. Um, and this whole idea of um, uh, shading, which is um, thereby uh, done naturally, and you can wander around in this space, so on, but what does worry me is um, the metal that the steel that went into cre creating this fabulous dome. Um, they say exceeds uh, the steel that went into the Eiffel Tower. Um, so yes, I mean uh, Abu Dhabi can afford it, but can we as a planet, we as a afford that kind of uh, material extraction? Um, and then I wonder, 
is that the best we can do because this we are we are still only talking about sustainability um personally i think sustainability is a we're just past that now um we don't have the resources um to sustain yeah, sustainability is yesterday today we have to talk about regeneration and i think if um Again, my uh, we want this is that any large space, any space, in your tiny domestic space, you it has to be about regeneration, and um, I think design has the responsibility to push beyond uh, uh, sustainability and to regeneration. I I am uh, looking at that fabulous uh, um, thinking about if this it was a forest. It could have provided shade, it could have provided oxygen, it could have, uh, you know, it, it could have given back it, um, instead of just uh, acting as a, um, as a, a purely a shade screen. Um, uh, so I think that's where design should be. And I think those huge uh, footprints of, um, the old museums, they have to start giving back as well. I think uh, some of them are looking at solar, but are they talking of 100% solar? Are they talking of 200% solar? Are they talking of uh, recycling their water? Is there anything being uh, given back? Um, so yes, I think sustainability is yesterday. And I think we should be talking of regeneration today. Um, and there are uh, little, um, in the uh, global network of uh, museum spaces um, where water is being recycled, where the aim is to be zero waste and zero carbon. And uh, I believe uh, museums certainly being um, holding uh, the memories of uh, our planet have that responsibility. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Sunila, for that very thought provocative presentation. I believe you have raised a lot of critical questions. And I thought it was quite interesting because when it comes to the objective of a museum, you um, what 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 those the curators and those who envision put the arts and they think of art as a means of, you know, while reflecting humanity, also talking about culture and heritage, but now it has come to a point to what extent can we afford to uh, use means as traditional as this to speak about uh, who we are and what we represent and our vision. So, and in a period where last year with the pandemic, even in Sri Lanka, we saw a lot of the art, although a lot of the art galleries and art spaces transforming their activities to uh, a series of virtual um, manifestations. And, and that clearly showed alternative ways of going about and even for a museum. So I feel it does uh, sort of address the virtual space and the physical space in a manner where we could bring the best of uh, the mediums in highlighting perhaps what arts can do to humanity. Um, having said that, we are now going to move on to Kinga Gregg's presentation. So over to you, Kinga. Um, yes, hello, everybody. Uh, firstly, I will just, uh, well, notice that uh, I share my office with a colleague and she's in a video conference also, so I hope that you will um, hear me well. Uh, and I thank Aurelia for sharing my document with you. Um, I will present to you uh, the sustainability engagement of the National Museum of Natural History, where I work, and especially the case of temporary exhibitions. Uh, in the next slide, <laughs> uh, yes, I will just um, 
underline uh, the few missions and goals of uh, my institution. Uh, uh, and in the next slide, you will see uh, the five missions, which are uh, the main missions of uh, my organization. Um, of course, uh, the conservation, the teaching, uh, but also what is interesting for us today is the dissemination of the knowledge. And, and to a lot of sites of ours uh, all around France, botanical gardens, zoological park, and especially also museums. Um, so on the next slide, uh, I will try to um, show you in few words the sustainable uh, development approach and the history of this approach uh, in our uh, museum. Um, Oh, well, actually, it began in 2008 with the signature of a charter, uh, and uh, this charter was focused on regulations and also concrete actions for each new project. Um, to support this engagement, a position has been uh, dead for a sustainable, uh, de sustainable development advisor, uh, Ms. Elza Borome, uh, who I thank for the presentation leaflet uh, you see now. Um, in the next slide, uh, I will just uh, show you uh, in general our environment policies, uh, which uh, targets are the reduction of consumption and also the reduction of damages of uh, our action and also the reduction of course of emission of gases, but also obviously the preservation of biodiversity. Um, on next slide, <laughs> uh, I would like to be much more focused on uh, what is important for us today, uh, especially exhibitions, museum exhibitions. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I'd like to, uh, to, to tell much more about the professionals which are involved in the conception of our exhibitions. So of course, our production of temporary exhibitions, we combine the expertises of three categories of professionals uh, in the cultural field, in the sustainable development field, and also in the technical fields. Um, but what's expected in our projects, you will see it in the next, of the next slide because in the Museum of Natural History, we have uh, very specific uh, criteria. Uh, so the next slide, you'll see that uh, our exhibition, temporary exhibitions should, well, are expected to be very immersive with very immersive recreated spaces and very original scenographies. And that's a big issue for the reuse of materials. Um, also because we have a lot of constraints and the constraints, the first one is the incapacity of storage and also a very, very short time for dismantling of the exhibitions. Um, that's why uh, we've started a reflection in 2012 about how to manage the end life of our exhibition. Uh, and you will see it on the next slide, then uh, four years after we managed to uh, have an amendment authorizing transfers of our furniture and materials to non-profit organizations and non-commercial. And then uh, we started to give our elements uh, to our own sites all around France for an internal reuse, but also to association and public organization. So we will see it in the next slide. Uh, yes, some, uh, some important dates. Uh, but uh, we would like, of course, to go further and not only to be focused just on the end life of the exhibitions. That's why on the next slide, we asked, uh, we wondered, uh, what can we do to reduce our impact, the impact of the production of our exhibitions? Um, and we decided uh, to go further uh, to analyze in 2017, uh, the life cycle of our exhibition, and especially of one of them, uh, you show here the, uh, the visual of this exhibition, which was Espèce d'Ours. Uh, yes, and see here you see a scheme of, uh, of, yes, of a life cycle of an exhibition from the selection of the subject, of course, to the end life of, of the exhibition, 
uh, passing through the dismantling, of course, the manufacturing phase, the design. So it is the whole uh, process of the conception of our exhibitions. And uh, in the case of Espèce Dux, uh, that you will see in the next slide, uh, first of all, it was important to defini define the scope of the study. Uh, so it was an exhibition on 600 square meters, uh, temporary exhibition. And uh, we started to analyze all the impacts of the materials that were used for the exhibition. On the next slide, you have some uh, important points. So of course, from the acquisition of raw materials up to the re recycling and the waste treatment. And uh, after this analysis, uh, our results, um, we, we tried to rank the results of this analysis. Uh, and we see that at the first uh, level, uh, we found the floor, the carpeted floor, which impacts are the most uh, important uh, in our exhibitions. The second impact, it was the impact of the walls, the wooden walls in, uh, constructed in MDF. And the third impact, the most third uh, important impact uh, was the divan, the material used for levels, graphic levels. Uh, so that's why uh, after this analysis and uh, having obtaining those results, uh, we tried to do some recommendations uh, for, well, actually in the next slide, uh, better uh, alternative materials. Uh, better that carpeted floor, maybe with natural materials. Uh, for MDF also uh, with some other wooden panels. Uh, but of course, uh, the best way is to try to find a, a kind of sobriety in using of the materials. Um, that's why uh, we tried to uh, do something more <laughs> for next project. And you will see it uh, in the next um, slide. Uh, and it is, it is our very last experience. Uh, actually, it is an exhibition which is open to the public uh, now. It opened in October this year, uh, and I've been the curator of the exhibition. And my purpose was to um, be the more uh, echo, uh, to, to, have, to get the more echo design process as possible, and not only to be focused on the end life of the materials, but to begin uh, this reflection from the very beginning of the project. Um, so my first aim was to reduce uh, the, the quantity of materials and to, to try to, to get a kind of sobriety in that. Also because I'm, I worked firstly as an exhibition designer, that's why I was very uh, involved in such a reflection. Um, but uh, this field was pretty rapidly abandoned, unfortunately, because uh, the subject of our exhibition, the topic was very, very difficult uh, and also very fragmented. That's why we need a lot of walls, unfortunately, so the sobriety was not uh, possible to obtain. Uh, the second point was to get a kind of low impact using new ecolabeled materials uh, with special libraries dedicated to that uh, and also, if possible, materials uh, from um, eco-resource uh, uh, centers. Um, and we tried to encourage uh, the scenographers who worked with us to, to, well, to accept this kind of vision and to try to, to work with such materials. Um, the third point uh, was to try also to uh, make the dismantling easiest uh, using special ecofabrication technicals uh, to make our materials possible for reuse uh, after the dismantling. Um, and the results <laughs> of this approach on the next slide, uh, well, is that we uh, achieved to have a very, very small uh, carpeted co coverings uh, for floor, only four square meters as our exhibitions was uh, on 650 square meters. So um, the sobriety uh, with that kind of materials was achieved. Uh, concerning the partition walls, uh, we tried to ask to use the more, uh, the more it was possible, um, uh, floors uh, of plywood uh, but of course, it's pretty expensive. Uh, that's why we have to mix it with MDF, but MDF uh, from um, recycled wood particles, practically at 100%. Uh, 
Um, and of course, we tried also to optimize these panels and to reuse also some parts of these panels for our furnitures. Um, and uh, what is possible for us now is to work with uh, the resource center we want to work with at the beginning for the end of the exhibition. And after the dismantling, they will collect uh, practically the whole panels and the whole materials of the exhibition for a reuse uh, for other projects, uh, especially cultural projects. The third point concerns the labels. Uh, and we try to limit uh, maximally the, the use of the labels. Firstly, using um, a material which is called aqua paper, uh, which is glued with aqua, uh, with water on the, on the walls, and also avoiding maximally plexiglass, uh, using the technique of silk screen transfer directly on the walls and on the wooden, um, well, on the wooden surfaces. Um, on the next slide, you'll see the other points. Uh, so I told you about the wallpaper, um, aqua paper, and also we tried to limit uh, the painting of the walls and we tried maximally to left row uh, the wooden panels. Um, other point also, the fifth point is the provenance of the art pieces. We try to limit also uh, the transport of the art pieces uh, and we choose to show uh, pieces, especially from France, even if we have three pieces uh, from abroad, one from South Korea, another one from the United States, and the third one from Great Britain, but uh, the majority of the art pieces are local. Um, and the sixth point uh, is our uh, devices, and we try to optimize uh, as more as possible uh, the stock of our, uh, of our digital and our lighting device. And uh, when it was absolutely impossible to um, manage our project uh, with our own stock, uh, we occasionally try to use uh, a stock, rental stock, but not purchasing it. Uh, and now I will show you some uh, views of this exhibition just to materialize a little bit more what I'm saying. Uh, so now you see that we have in, the, out of, in the, this first view uh, on one side, uh, the, the, yeah, on the right side you have, um, well, our um, walls covered with wallpaper and on the other side you have uh, the raw uh, wooden, uh, wooden walls without any paintings. Uh, yes, uh, here you see a furniture which, which was conceived with uh, the wooden scraps uh, of our wall uh, for an installation with uh, those sneakers. Um, on the, on the next slide, you'll see that we try to avoid maximally to use showcases. So uh, at the first, uh, firstly, you see um, the sculpture by our Korean artist, which is just hang on on the ceiling and there is just a podium uh, uh, beside. And you see also another tr kind of showcase, but without plexiglass, uh, just with textile uh, all over, uh, just to avoid maximally this material, which is very impactful. Um, on the other slide, you see another sculpture, again, without showcase, just with a podium and with a detection, desi detection device, security device. Uh, and when you approach uh, too, too far, it's just beeping like that, but uh, we manage to avoid showcases. Uh, here is, uh, on the next slide, a skull uh, from an artist, French artist, Philippe Pasqua. Uh, firstly, we, will, we would like to have a school by Damien Hirst, uh, but uh, finally we choose to have a school from a French artist, so the impact is better also <laughs> uh, regarding the transport, uh, the transport side. Uh, then on the next slide, we have a projection of films and we use uh, our own walls uh, to project on one side and on the other side it's a textile which is hang on and it's not a wooden, uh, a wooden wall just to avoid maximally uh, the use of, of materials. And uh, on next slide, you see that we use also our own collections uh, from Natural History Museum for this installation. And there is a focus on the next slide on one of, uh, of this collection. And uh, to end this exhibition, we have a room uh, where there is a story about the future. And here we use um, seats which are totally echo uh, conceived and echo uh, uh, well, eco designed, um, and we we wanted to to show through this installation that our message is focused on sobriety, and that's why it was important that the furniture uh, uh, should be uh, you know uh, 
related to, to the message we wanted to deliver to the, to the audience. Uh, so, of course, I will just uh, finish my presentation with um, the concrete actions. Uh, I told you that uh, we wanted to use, reuse materials, uh, collaborating with um, this uh, Reserve des Arts, which is a company who is a, a, a resource center, but this was not possible because uh, it was absolutely too expensive. Unfortunately for the moment, it's too expensive to transport and especially to manufacture reuse materials. That's why we were not able to, to do this. And, and well, unfortunately it's not possible for this project, but I hope so maybe for next project with um, maybe a, a lower quantity of, uh, of, of panels, it would be maybe possible to retry again uh, to consult some firms and to, to well, integrate uh, reuse materials in our project. And of course, uh, there are a lot of obstacles for the moment. On the next slide, you'll see that, of course, the obstacles, as I told you, are uh, the expensive cost of reuse materials uh, in our exhibition, unfortunately, also the unmaturity of the public sector, because we wanted also to collaborate with other museums, maybe to have a kind of exchange platform of furniture and materials, but for the moment, people are not ready for doing that. They reuse sometimes their own furniture and their own materials, but there is no uh, an exchange platform uh, uh, for the moment for, for sharing it between us. Um, and it, there is also a problem in such an institution like ours in the classification in fire uh, of our materials. And sometimes it's a difficulty uh, to, to reuse materials from other sectors than cultural one. Um, and of course, there are also some other obstacles uh, on the last slide uh, because uh, we tried to encourage our scenographers to use ecolabel materials, but they were not prepared to do that because they are used to work uh, all the time with the same materials for temporary exhibition. So, yes, it's it's important to to maybe encourage and also educate uh, our uh, our scenographers and the people who are working with us to. Yes, to maybe change the practices and also to discover new materials, but it's not easy. And uh, of course, as I told you before, uh, we have uh, pressure also and constraints of fast dismantling time and also logistical barriers because we have no storage. And that's why sometimes it's very difficult to encourage the um, reuse of our own materials for the end, end life. But we try, well, for the moment, uh, we, we tried to, to um, do our practice better and for this uh, well uh, exhibitions I just uh, showed you uh, I hope we will achieve to 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 give and to reuse all the all the materials that have been used for for this project thank you thank you uh, Kinga it was uh, it was very interesting listening to your presentation because the scale at which you do work is something that is a little unfamiliar here for those in Sri Lanka and uh, the getting into the, the, the mechanics behind and the finer details behind the exhibitions and the spaces sort of gave light to the extent to which sustainability needs to play a role uh, going forward considerably when it comes to building museums and also in sustaining those that are already uh, in existence. So thank you for that. And Kinga, um, now we move on to Shani Pereira, who will come from a very interesting perspective of education. Thanks, Azara. Uh, it's lovely to be here and uh, really great to be here with this panel. Uh, I've been enjoying what I've been hearing so far. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. I should be sharing my screen. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk uh, a little about um, conservation and sustainability from uh, my background with the Academy of Design, uh, which is design based, of course. Um, and a few areas I'm walking into today is uh, the art artisanal conservation aspect of how uh, the AOD ecosystem looks at conserving, conservation and sustainability, and how we do this through education, 
and also through retail. And what does this mean uh, with how we are also looking at projecting what we do to the future? Um, uh, so I, I think uh, the discussions going around with uh, how conserva uh, conservation is compatible with sustainability or is it really hand in hand something that we explore uh, along with the topic of museums. And um, I think if we look at the overall uh, purpose of uh, museums from the many definitions it has, uh, a very interesting aspect of it is sustaining communities uh, and remembering from the past to the future where these communities uh, can go. Um, and when you kind of start dissecting museums and the role museums play uh, from this angle of communities, uh, it's important to start thinking about how much of object-based collections and curations uh, can really uh, bring this into a full perspective uh, and address these needs and these dialogues uh, representing communities. Um, and this is a very progressive discussion that's already happening just as much as uh, the points and uh, analysis we see in this, this, uh, this panel today as well. Um, so looking beyond muse, if we are looking beyond museums uh, as object-based collections and storytelling spaces, uh, where else can we go to do this communal uh, storytelling and uh, discussions about communities? So ideally kind of looking at how decentralizing museum spaces and what other spaces can the same activity or the same uh, experiences happen in other active, uh, active creative design spaces is something I'm going to talk about today. Uh, ideally, with, again, with the AOD ecosystem, uh, how this happens in educational spaces and how this can happen in retail spaces um, is what uh, mostly I'll be talking about. And uh, we are based uh, from all the uh, aspects we work with in AOD. Um, it's more on an artisanal background. We work. Um, we kind of work a lot with artisan communities and uh, this helps us to build and talk more about conserving and preserving um, social and ecological sustainability locally. Um, and the main platform that kind of VOD ecosystem has is Design for Sustainable Development Foundation. Uh, this is a front that helps artisans to not just work and find their strengths with the skills and abilities they have, but where design starts coming in and working with them from a point of uh, what we create, what kind of stories, what kind of uh, curation of the craft sector we are able to do from the... Sorry, Kinga, I think you're not on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and how we uh, can further look into uh, working with the craft communities and the artisanal communities to build a better sustainable dialogue in design as well. Um, so Design for Sustainable Development has over 300 artists and families right now employed. There is over 250 women empowered uh, and it's adding up to be much more now. Um, and basically we have many environmental practices um, that we keep looking into while also looking at how all this can empower women and promote heritage skills. Our main part with DFSD is uh, again something we believe uh, again the ecosystem is highly necessary for conservation, which is uh, training, education, sharing knowledge and R&D. Um, you will see how this further comes into the dialogue of what we do from the educational space as well. Um, and there is so much to learn from the artisanal communities when we are uh, hoping to conserve them. And at the same time, there's so much knowledge to share with them as well from the design backgrounds that we have within the ecosystem. Um, we don't uh, stop within the local sphere only. We try our best to work with artisanal communities out of uh, Sri Lanka. Um, recently, uh, also this was one of uh, one uh, post pandemic uh, trainings we further went ahead with, uh, with uh, Nepal and uh, this cultural knowledge exchange really helps us to identify and understand um, how globally artisanal approaches are being taken in conser conserving uh, communities. Um, and 
in AOD, uh, the ecosystem fashion is being uh, a major front that we play and we can uh, reach out to the artisanal conservation aspects. And this really has helped us to re-look at how we educate uh, the upcoming generation on design. Um, for example, uh, fashion has always been the topic area of luxury brands, uh, having catwalk designers, and really kind of uh, building communities for fashion design from a luxury uh, point of view. Um, and it's breaking down into transparency, like many things, many sectors are right now uh, overall. Um, and it's really forced uh, universities and academies, uh, design-oriented academies and institutes to really look at what is our curriculum. Uh, what are the main teaching learning objectives uh, we are uh, uh, kind of distributing among uh, our students. Um, further ta taking this into consideration with how we run the uh, internal educational part of uh, Academy of Design, um, there are certain projects that we really kind of have made it compulsory for students to look into heritage uh, projects where they intensely work with um, artisans and it's not just working with artisans from a point of getting the product end product done but really training with the artisan and identifying the skill sets and abilities you need to be able to uh, take this forward in many ways uh, to the future and something interesting we keep uh, observing is how the design young designers are very capable of bringing in to the table something more than just what they practice with the artisan uh, knowledge sharing uh, and take it to an, another futuristic area. Um, this is a, a, one of our second year students work currently who's uh, exploring um, uh, very uh, elaborately with um, how weaving techniques are being done. And it's been, it's been really interesting to see how we look at artisanal education for designers uh, in conserving um, when it comes to the post pandemic situation. Um, we used to have a lot of field trips where our students could go and meet the artisans, um, but it, it's, things have changed now. Um, it, it's not, uh, it, you're not in the place where you can have a, um, a virtual discussion with an artisan, uh, unfortunately. And how, how, how does the designers, how do designers, how do young people then communicate with artisans and really practice these uh, skills and abilities they learn and, and we've seen a very resilient front uh, from this and students have been very creative on their home fronts, how they uh, obtain uh, sources and uh, how they build and kind of work around these techniques they can't uh, have access to in the normal day-to-day -day, um, experience they would have if they're working with artisans. Um, this is a um, Batik related project, uh, one of our second uh, year students did this again, post pandemic. And uh, it was really interesting to see how she developed her own uh, styles uh, and with minimal assistance and uh, guidance from uh, the artisanal community and also from, um, of course, the uh, tutors uh, due to the pandemic. And uh, it, the process work is something we really understood that when you let autonomous, uh, uh, autonomous practices to take place, once artisanal practices are introduced to communities, um, younger people, they are very capable of kind of improvising and going ahead with it. Um, uh, this is uh, another heritage project where uh, the handloom and the weaving, everything was very experimental. And uh, post pandemic, it was much more experimental than we, us we usually see with our uh, uh, explorations in heritage project from students. Um, it was very interesting to see how the students were uh, finding their sources from uh, natural, uh, 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 the natural habitat around them. And there was more exploration there happening and uh, their complete kind of uh, creativity came through with the limitations we saw as well. Again, what is, uh, this was very interesting for us to observe what is really then artisanal and uh, what is really uh, taking forward artisanal skills and abilities. How much of improvisation do we allow? How much of uh, creativity do we add in into the usual traditional practices uh, that there is? Um, and I think we see this more uh, with our alumni when they actually go out after learning their practices from the artisanal front in conserving 
um, and they kind of bring in the innovation factors and the tech factors from upcycling to uh, looking at new uh, methods of uh, relaying uh, that artisanal techniques learn, um, or even looking at uh, incorporating uh, technology such as uh, Kamali's collection, which has a water resistant uh, handle. So it's very interesting to see how artisanal conservation can take you into a progressive aspect through the educational sphere and the knowledge uh, exchange that happens from a conservation point. Um, and from a retail space point, uh, it, it's very interesting to see how we can look at artisanal skills being uh, curated through um, the retail uh, products and services that happen with the curation of them as a brand or as, uh, as stories uh, of the retail aspects that we see. Um, and these are, uh, the, there are a couple of segments of uh, products and services we see under, for example, Urban Island, uh, again, part of the ecosystem of AOD. And it's very interesting to see how the curation of it happens, um, not from a retail marketing point, but we really kind of build the stories around conserving, again, the artisanal and the heritage factors we use, the products and um, manufacturing processes with it. Uh, everything here is sustainable material. Everything here we create is sustainable processes. And this is something that we really feel when we try to conserve uh, the artisanal community automatically starts becoming inbuilt within the designers and our AOD uh, individuals as well. Um, so it's been interesting to see, can artifact curation actually happen through retail as well? Um, just like it is being uh, something that is uh, something we can do uh, even with education. And uh, lastly, I just want to touch on another um, aspect of how you can look into the uh, digital and physical spaces of retail also, uh, where we look into uh, digital aspects, where uh, you start combining the virtual and the, uh, the physical uh, platforms for curation of uh, sustainable conservation um, aspects. And this was really interesting from a digital point to see how do we uh, curate our artisanal uh, products again uh, into a bigger, larger audience as well. And where we are able to expose our artisanal skills much more than the local sphere. Um, going into the front of this topic of how do we look at conservation without looking at only museum spaces and looking into uh, other design and creative spaces to do the same. Um, it's interesting to see that in the digital fashion world, um, everything is really going into and questioning the physical, tangible creation of things. And this has been a very challenging topic because uh, you can't really talk about design creativity without uh, creating tangible products or tangible um, uh, aesthetics. Um, however, it's, it's transcending into a very interesting uh, area and an interesting dialogue. And I like to leave, uh, because I'm also pondering on this question, I think Azara, we had a brief chat about this, but um, I'm also still pondering on this, that whether digital artifact curation for artisans is actually something viable. And with so far, uh, what we have seen uh, and what's happening around in the fashion world, um, there are the, there is this interesting topic of NFTs, uh, happening and uh, then there's also the the usual AR VR technologies coming into the fashion and artisanal discussion but I think there is deeper technology now taking over such as um, the machine learning and uh, kind of really AI algorithms coming through uh, recently uh, Anador Studio uh, did some really great um, uh, texture based uh, work with MoMA and we, we start seeing like the same kind of artisanal fibers and technologies and skills and the practices coming through in digital spheres. So you really start questioning uh, how can this further be going into deeper with these digital manipulations. Um, and another very interesting technological front, personally I've been interested in is the neural net um, where we really kind of look into uh, artificial neural networks. And uh, it's very, very, it's amazing how you see the same kind of fiber weaving 
patterns and technology being used in this uh, system. So um, there might be a part or a time where these two will completely start um, crossing paths, or maybe not. Uh, it's something exciting to see. Um, so far, so good. Uh, however, I feel digital artifact curation for artisans will really help us and help us uh, move into another era of conserving um, the artisanal skills that we have uh, right now only on the physical space. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, again, uh, uh, Edelput uh, really uh, has forecasted this, that we are definitely going back to being informed by the arts and craft movements. Um, yeah, personally, that's good news uh, for me, and uh, it's a great movement. But uh, it also really implies that conservation efforts uh, are really key in being a designer. And I think uh, I, I, I fully agree when uh, Sunela said uh, we, are, we are beyond sustainability now. And uh, I think it's now more about really looking at what do we have now and how do we keep this uh, kind of encapsulated into the future and how we do it is a key part that designers and whatever design spaces we create uh, need to do. And I think it's not the role of the museums only anymore, but it's a huge role of designers to take part in conservation and uh, make everything else look sustainable as well along in that path um, and use sustainable methods. Um, yeah, that's it from me. I hope I stayed in my 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Shani, for your multifaceted perspective. I think it was very interesting to see how the objectives of museums can also be uh, pursued by different means. And also, like you very correctly also pointed out, a nation, I believe Anand Kumar Swami said this, a nation is not made of uh, businessmen and politicians, but arts, artists and poets. So the arts and what the museum holds is of very high value to the evolution of humanity at large. So we now are posed with many a challenge of which um, the environment and also sustainability also containing other elements uh, from the economics to the people. It's interesting to see how the virtual space and now you've got the metaverse coming in along with the NFTs. So you really want to um, sort of dissect and see to what extent the human experience is also going to exist while conservation perhaps would gain uh, from these mediums. So it's definitely a lot of food for thought and uh, we're looking forward to exploring this further. And um, Anais, uh, if we could uh, have you present next, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for uh, the invitation and I apologize for arriving um, a little bit uh, late uh, so oh, i will right. share my my screen um, if i can find my powerpoint no sorry i i can't see my powerpoint on the um i may put it into pdf sorry um Sorry for that. <laughs> okay, I try again. Yeah. Um. So, uh, So can you see my uh, PowerPoint? Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, perfect. Um, so um, to introduce my presentation, so uh, my name is Anaïs Rush and I, um, I'm based in Paris and I worked, I'm uh, volunteering actually for a French think tank um, called the Shift Project. Um, the Shift Project is a non-profit organization um, that advocate for a post-carbon economy. Um, so we produce, uh, let's say, scientific reports and um, that are dedicated to uh, informing and influencing the debate uh, on the energy transition in France, but also in uh, Europe. Um, 
So it's it's a think tank uh, mainly. Uh, so I'm from the cultural sector, but the think tank um, there are a lot of uh, uh, scientists and engin uh, engineers in this think tank, and we work on different areas of the um, of the the energy transition, which means uh, uh, transport, uh, buildings, industry, etc. And uh, I joined the think tank three years ago, and I suggested to. Um, uh, open a new uh, research area in the cultural sector because I had this feeling we were lacking of uh, technical information um, uh, and te and technical concrete tools to transform um, our um, our sector. Uh, so uh, the the study um, I will uh, now uh, is is a very new one. We just published it uh, a few days ago. And it's part of a of a bigger um, of a big research program uh, uh, we started last year uh, during COVID, um, and it's a systemic approach of how uh, to transform our society uh, focused on France, uh, how to transform um, society with a systematic approach uh, toward energy transition. So we have. Um, uh, our analysis is not in terms of, um, let's say, of uh, its economic one. It's not in terms of uh, money, but rather on physical flows. So, in this context, what we, uh, our main message for the cultural sector is, um, of course, this sector has to transform itself to reduce its carbon footprint and respect the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, but it's also um, it also has to transform itself to be more resilient, uh, because um, this is our main message. Uh, the cultural sector is vulnerable, and it's really um, at risk. So if we want to uh, keep um, existing and uh, developing, uh, whether um, um, exhibitions or films or um, uh, theater pieces, uh, we have to adapt to this new uh, context. Um, so our main um, principle, maybe I will start with the, um, the presentation and, and, and I will come back to our um, main um, dynamics uh, we want to implement in the sector. Um, so within this study, um, we, we have a small team, so each of, of us focused on a different cultural area. So uh, I focused on visual arts, galleries, uh, Museums, sorry, I didn't mention museums and art fairs. Um, other colleagues focused on cinema and other on um, uh, live music, um, literature. Uh, so we tried to cover um, the whole cultural sector. So we had a very pragmatic approach. Uh, so I, sorry, I just translated the, the PowerPoint um, from our presentation, but we'll see some information still in French. So we had our uh, a pragmatic approach. Um, uh, because um, uh, the visual art sector in France is really um, uh, heterogeneous, uh, it's it's not uh, uh, it's very um, diverse. Uh, we have a uh, um, private sector, we have um, uh, subsidized public uh, institutions, we have um, artists and other uh, professionals with very diverse um, uh, statuses and sometimes very uh, precarious. So both economic um, the production and distribution issues are really different as well as the degree of um, exposure to the climate uh, clim uh, climate and energy risks um, so but i think that they, this sector um, even even if it's very diverse has two common characteristics the first one is that it's part of an extremely globalized system and therefore really uh, highly dependent uh, on fossil fuels on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, uh, it's st this sector still uh, ignores uh, uh, its dependency and its impacts. Um, so in this study, uh, we don't pretend to cover the field um, exhaustively, uh, but we focused mainly on practices existing reports and studies produced by major uh, national museums and also some foreign studies um, on the art market. So I will start with um, um, this uh, part. 
Uh, sorry, this I didn't. Um, <laughs> so as you can see, it's, it's French and English. So the first focus um, uh, for us is uh, the mobility issue because uh, when we uh, started to uh, do our research, uh, we um, we realized that the main issue uh, was really about mobility. And uh, this study I am sharing with you um, really goes um, uh, drew the same conclusion. It's it's a um, it's a report uh, presented um, in April this year by Julie's Bicycle called "The Art of Zero. And this is they they try to make a global a carbon footprint of the global art world. So it's a, it was a, a huge um, challenge. And so, according to the, to this uh, study, the um, global carbon footprint of the visual art sector is of uh, 18 million um, uh, tons of um, um, uh, gas emissions. Uh, but when you add visitors, uh, then it it uh, turns to 70 million, which is huge. Which means that um, almost 75 percent of uh, the visual art sector carbon footprint is uh, uh, because of visitor travels, going to biennials, going uh, to uh, foreign museums, uh, going to art fairs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, uh, and then this is another uh, study. Uh, so, an another uh, surveyed uh, survey I used uh, from the Art Market 2020 report. Uh, which surveyed um, 1,000, more than 1,000 uh, collectors. And um, according to this survey, uh, these collectors, uh, I mean, wealthy collectors, uh, attend on average um, 39 events uh, per year, meaning exhibitions, uh, gallery visits, and also fairs. And 18 of them um, are abroad. Uh, so what is really interesting for us uh, here is that among this sample, French, French collectors are the are number one uh, in terms of uh, mobility, and they travel twice as much as uh, Americans, for example. So of course, uh, this hyper uh, mobility and the organizations and the events that de depend on it are extremely vulnerable to energy and health crisis crises, uh, crises, as um, we saw, of course, with uh, COVID. So uh, we haven't quantified it yet, uh, but we think that given this um, and that this conclusion, um, uh, anal analyzing this different uh, survey, uh, since mobility is a primary source of carbon impact in a global art world, uh, then digitalization of fairs and events um, that were developed with COVID could be a part of the solution. Uh, since it uh, drastically reduces the mobility of the public and professionals. Uh, of course, there are two limits to this hypothesis because uh, the mobility of the artworks uh, remains real on the one hand. And on the other hand, this should not divert our attention from the recent uh, digital innovation that are particularly uh, energy consuming as um, Kani Pereira um, um, just uh, mentioned before, for example, with the NFT. Uh, so we hope to uh, develop uh, further uh, research uh, in the coming months on this specific aspect of NFT and the impact of uh, the digital in the in the art world. So I have I can't give any number yet, but we are in the process of um, working on that. Um, and when we uh, look at museum, uh, we can uh, draw the same conclusions because, for example, when the Louvre, the uh, Louvre Museum calculated its first carbon footprint in 2009, it concluded that 99% of uh, its um, um, gas uh, emissions were linked to visitors. And uh, similarly, the um, um, Grand Palais, so the Réunion des Musées Nationaux Grand Palais, um, who also, which also calculated its carbon footprint, uh, showed that year after year, almost one third of its emissions were linked to the um, to the visitors. So, however, uh, if we look at museums and exclude um, visitors' mobility, then we can identify three major areas of gas emissions on which a museum can take action without uh, changing their mission. 
Um, first, uh, the transportation of the work of arts, uh, scenography, and energy performance of uh, buildings. Uh, so these um, these three items, you can. So what we want to show is that we can uh, improve these three items without questioning the standards of the profession in museums. Um, so for when if we start with the uh, mobility of the um, of the of works of the art, uh, the works of art. Um, we realized uh, talking to different museum professionals that the carbon impact um, of an exhibition is almost never taken into consideration when curators develop their uh, scientific proposal. Uh, I mean, I'm not talking about the, the Museum d'Histoire Naturelle, but <laughs> uh, rather uh, like art, um, art museum, um, art exhibitions. Um, so and actually, when they when programming the curators and museums can choose to play different uh, between different factors uh, that are listed, and it's this combination of uh, factors uh, that can uh, ultimately affect uh, the carbon footprint. So uh, it's not about uh, having a simplistic vision uh, that we should um, give up flying or um, half uh, the number of works, for example. But this reflection must be uh, taken into account for the, the, um, the programming. So you, you can uh, either consider the number of work that are transported, the mode of transport, um, the origin of the work. Uh, th this was already mentioned by uh, the Natural History Museum. The weight of the works uh, is also uh, very um, important. important. So uh, you can see this uh, table we uh, used uh, data uh, by um, inspired by the Grand Palais uh, exhibitions, and we simulated the impact of several um, like uh, blockbuster exhibitions, and we realized that, for example, a, a European exhibition of a little bit less than 500 uh, works transported um, by a road uh, is more polluting than an exhibition of uh, 200 works. Uh, transported only for one um, for 25 uh, percent by air so this is just to say it's not um, as, as simplistic and easy you really have to consider all the different aspects um, of um, of your exhibition when it comes to uh, uh, transportation of the of the works of art um, then two other uh, items, and I think it was already um, uh, well uh, explained, so I will mm, be quite quick uh, on, on this. Uh, of course, um, uh, working on a less carbon intensive uh, scenography. So, uh, and I think uh, Kinga uh, already mentioned uh, the, um, the most polluting materials and how to um, work, uh, recycle, and also have a whole, um, uh, how do you say, reflection upon circular economy. Uh, so, for example, we made a simulation of a uh, calculation of a, of a fare of a little bit than, less than uh, 2,000 square meters entirely covered with carpet, and we realized that 61% uh, of the um, emissions, uh, carbon uh, emissions of the scenography were linked to the carpet, and uh, more than 20% uh, linked to the scrap cotton, which means that 70% uh, of the emissions of this scenography are, um, depends on these two items, for example. Um, another specificity uh, of uh, the sector, of the visual art sector in the museums is uh, our mission of uh, conservation of the um, uh, works of art, which is governed by uh, standards shared by the entire profession in all museums in the world, which, which also makes changes a little bit complicated, uh, because of course uh, museums have to um, uh, are faced with important constraints in terms of light, in terms of temperature, uh, hydrometry uh, of the rooms, and uh, so there are these international standards uh, of humidity and of temperature, um, and uh, the museums have to respect these norms, um, because if they don't, they can't um, um, hire, uh, uh, they can they can, it, I mean, it's a condition for the loan of uh, the works between museums. 
so if you don't respect these norms, you can't um, have um, uh, temporary uh, exhibitions. So what we recommend is um, uh, uh, to reconsider it, or how could you say, relaxation of the conservation standards, which would give museum more um, the heating on, or air uh, conditioning of the spaces during temporary uh, exhibitions. So of course it's much easier uh, when you, um, you have your um, own uh, own collections. Um, and, and there are some examples of uh, museums in France uh, who are uh, doing that. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned um, at the very beginning, we have um, in, for the whole um, uh, research, the, the, this uh, study of the um, carbon footprint of the, the cultural sector in France. We have five implementation dynamics. Um, I mean, five, which mean five big principles. Uh, the first one uh, is our recommendation. The first one is uh, to uh, relocate activities. The second one is uh, simply, but it's not as simple as we think, uh, to slow down. Um, the third one is to reduce scales. Um, this has to see with uh, provenience of work, for example, if I take this um, example. Um, the first one is to eco-conceive. Uh, so this is linked to um, both the works of art, but also exhibitions and scenographies. Uh, and the fifth is uh, to renounce or uh, to give up. And this is, um, for example, to renounce to um, to uh, new digital um, uh, innovations that um, uh, require too much um, energy, for example. So uh, in order to make these uh, transformations concrete and to support the sector's um, actors in this uh, decarbonization um, um, trajectory perspective, we have uh, developed um, um, what we call a typology of transformations with for the, the visual art sector, about 25 uh, proposals. I, I will send you the link um, of our report. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's, in, it's in French. Um, so at this stage, we are not uh, in a position to quantify the carbon impact of uh, the application of all these transformations we suggest by um, 2030, because we still lack um, uh, data, this is a big issue uh, in the cultural sector. We have very few um, um, uh, data, so we have to uh, find them and, and do our own calculation, which really takes some time. So here are a few, um, I put a few examples of them, and you can find all of them in our uh, report. So we have four categories, it's, it's in French, but uh, it's, it's almost the same in English, so we have uh, trans transparent um, transformation, which are the easiest uh, one to implement than the positive ones, which means they're a little bit, they're quite easy to implement, but the, um, they also have a positive impact on other sector um, involved in this transformation. Then we have stronger ones, offensive ones and defensive ones. So to give you some um, example of them, for example, a very easy um, uh, things to do when you're in a museum is you can draft a charter of um, commitment of the museum that um, would be signed by the presidency and the, admi uh, the administration. You can also provide um, um, eco-design tools for exhibitions, for example. Uh, then um, positive transformation are uh, related, for example, to uh, training of uh, all professionals on sustainable development, energy and climate issues. Uh, you, um, you can also request um, what we call, yeah, carbon estimate from transporters um, so to encourage the, the uh, transport companies uh, to be more, um, uh, to, to think better of their impacts uh, in terms of uh, transport and packaging. Uh, then the offensive transformations, uh, for example, we suggest uh, museums to allocate uh, uh, carbon uh, budget uh, for temporary uh, exhibitions. Uh, 
um, and also uh, to be more flexible, uh, but this is at an international level, to be more flexible on international uh, conservation standards. And then the, the defensive transformations, uh, so it's about uh, renunciation, as I said before. Uh, for example, um, when, uh, renunciate, um, renounce, to renounce um, um, uh, using uh, high carbon technological uh, devices uh, and or to renounce um, uh, to transport some works um, of art, uh, for example, that are uh, maybe coming from uh, too far away um, or that are um, uh, heavy uh, uh, works of art. So there are many different um, uh, possibilities to, to transform uh, toward a more resilient um, a visual art uh, system and, and museum um, system. Of course, this takes time, and this is why uh, we have this um, structure of uh, the from the easiest transformation to the more radical ones. So you can go step by step and see where your museum is, what you can do today, what you should plan for next year, um, etc., etc. So this was a short. Um, presentation and I would be happy to answer um, your questions if you have regarding this report. Thank you. Thank you, Inez, for that uh, extensive perspective on the museum. Uh, what was actually quite uh, uh, um, heartwarming, I'd say, to hear is that the sustainable angle of uh, visual art sort of comes from things outside that of the artistic principle. For example, you're talking about mobility and buildings and cutting, um, cutting or sort of focusing on the elements. Those impact on the environment would pay, play a far larger role in contributing to the sustenance of these spaces as opposed to compromising on the works of art or the numbers in that sense. So that was very reassuring and very comprehensive in understanding the mechanics behind um, the museum and its process. So having uh, completed the presentations of all uh, panelists, it has been very interesting sort of looking at uh, how each of you from coming from different different perspectives as curators, as educationists, and also as a practitioner of architect sort of approach this subject. So on this note, I would, um, I would like to pose a general question to all of you to sort of uh, perhaps share your, your thoughts on how you feel con, con, um, the virtual experience of art in the forms of even this being uh, from a webinar to online showcases to exhibitions. How can they sort of take on a more monumental role in connecting communities while also not compromising on the tangible experience one has when they visit a museum or experience uh, works of art, because we saw an increase during the pandemic where a lot of the art institutions and spaces took on this medium and it not just um, created, it, it did not only create larger detail in the expression, but also accessibility to a larger audience. Um, so I, I would like to uh, keep this question open and would like to hear any thoughts that any of you would like to share. I, think I would say, Azara, that to start with the idea that um, the virtual world has no carbon footprint is of course not, it's that something to be taken to task. And what we know is that um, the resources that go into even providing internet or sending a satellite, that you know, it, 
we have we don't i i don't know if there's a way in which we have metrics for how that virtual infrastructure works against the museum infrastructure and where that i think that um data is quite nascent so i don't think we have comparisons or comparisons that we could apply here at the moment um for us I, as i said with the trust we're trying hard to look at large-scale approaches and also very minute approaches so we do things uh, with this upcoming exhibition for example instead of printing a guide we will have that available um, online so we are um, it's not that we don't rely on the virtual world in that sense but i don't think we think of it as necessarily as necessarily a means of carbon of reducing our footprint uh, because it doesn't necessarily. Um, and it's also, I think when we choose to do a physical exhibition, we think very hard about it and all the resources that go into it and where those resources are coming from. That initial decision comes with a lot of thought and where possible with, a, with figures to back why we're doing what we're doing. Um, but once that decision is taken, then um, it's not, I, it's not it's never a case of like if we're doing a book it's not a case of do we make this book in print or do we release it um online i think the choice to print a book we we take that responsibility very seriously and if it's a book it needs to last it needs to think about where its paper is coming from we need to really think about how we don't move and is it, is it warranted but the, it's not in our institution it's not um i think we see those as two sort of stratospheres at this point, the what's happening virtually versus um, what's happening physically. Although then there are these instances in which they can supplement each other. Azara, you're on mute. Mm, also, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yes, um, and Kinga, during uh, during the conversation, you were talking about traveling exhibitions, and with Anes's presentation on mobility and travel also taking a large uh, carbon footprint. Um, to what extent do you see the 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 scale at which traveling exhibitions should partake going in the future? Um, actually, well, just. A Put it because I can hear you uh, well. Um, well, actually, we decided a few years ago to change our approach of touring exhibitions, and uh, now we uh, do prefer not to uh, travel them, but uh, mm -hmm. to have another perspective, um, just to uh, make an opportunity to give to the other institution uh, the contents, the text, the audiovisuals. Uh, and maybe some devices, but very few, those devices which are very complicated, difficult to be reproduced. Um, so we propose just few materials and uh, we well, propose uh, another kind of collaboration. So uh, we give all the contents, some device, and then collaborate with the institution to adapt to their own cultural uh, uh, perspective and also we encourage them to have their own scenography, their own scenographer, their own films also locally implemented of course. So uh, it's a well a, a change of paradigm uh, and we began it uh, approximately five years ago this reflection and now we uh, generalized it uh, to all of our exhibitions. Mm, okay that's interesting. And um, Shani, if I am to uh, sort of explore the topic in which you discussed when it came to NFTs, um, to what extent do you find your students who are designers engaging in this practice? What is their level of interest? And is conservation a component that they think of when their interest lies in it? Or does it have a, a a technological culture that is sort of taking forward in their pursuit of it. I would like to understand what the new generation is thinking and how they're approaching uh, these uh, fields. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to uh, beat generation uh, Gen Z. 
because uh, I think uh, just because I guess I'm spending a lot of time with them, I'm a little biased because I see them all the time and uh, they're really nice. <laughs> but uh, I think there's beyond that, they're really uh, intrigued on technology and that's a given. Uh, these, this is the generation that was born with the screens in their hands. But um, they are much more avid believers of the better of better side of trying to make things better in the world or committing into their passions, into their way forward in education, maybe careers, maybe what they will do in any context um, as a point of being responsible citizens. So, um, so if you even just saw, I mean, it was very brief, quick uh, uh, slides of uh, student work, but um, these are kids who are constantly on Snapchat or um, you know, Instagram or whatever, but at the same time, when they're working with the artisanals, uh, artisans, they're completely embedded and infused with that culture and with uh, grasping that knowledge. And then they use their interest and their um, avid uh, interest in technology to try and really see what does this mean and where does this need to go. So even NFTs, um, yeah, our students are exploring it as well. Um, there's a lot of technological explorations. They automatically get into exploring. Um, however, um, I think uh, uh, there is a limitation of so much tech that is also accessible here from a point of just um, regional accessibility to technology and uh, sustainable tools, uh, sustainability designing tools, etc. Um, I think the, I'm being hopeful on the fact that that topic is happening and there is awareness of that in the current upcoming generations. And I think because they're a very conscious group of um, uh, the citizens, I think they'll use it to the betterment of things uh, and not kind of in a more uh, capitalist economical way, but really of making and changing things. Um, yeah, I don't know if I, uh, kind of answered your question, Azara, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sunila, if I may ask uh, you, uh, as a practitioner of architecture, and as someone who has engaged with buildings throughout your life, and now seeing how spaces are interpreted in different senses, and also you, like, uh, like uh, Shani just brought in, you have a virtual space and you have a lot of interest lying in it as well. So how do you see this transformation complementing or um, adapting to some of the staggering of, or addressing rather some of the staggering realities that you pointed out in your presentation very correctly? Well, uh, what you said earlier, Azara, um, uh, whether it can, can be done without uh, compromising the experience. I think um, there will be uh, uh, some compromising um, in that uh, it, it will compromise an experience as we have known it. Uh, it. But what it might actually be doing is changing the way we approach uh, you know, uh, 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 experiences, uh, experience uh, um, that we were familiar with, but um, that we learned in the pandemic and we adjust pretty well uh, to, um, you know, tailor our expectations to uh, what was possible. And I think uh, that may be viewed as a compromise, that may be viewed as, you know, very practical the reality of where we are uh, you know, presently uh, in, in terms of uh, the human impact on the planet, you know, the impact of the Anthropocene uh, on the planet. So that it compromise whether it's uh, how one experiences it. It's, it's a matter of uh, how one chooses to accept and understand. And I suppose now sustainability becomes a priority, not a choice like uh, many of you highlighted in your presentation as well. And now it's like you Sunila pointed out, it's not even about sustainability, it's about regeneration. We have come to a very um, 
unfortunate uh, circumstance in that sense. We but, don't have the. We, I don't think we. Yeah. I don't think we. I don't think. Uh, I. I'm saying. I'm saying we are about sustainability simply because we don't have the resources to sustain. Sustainability is based on adequate resources. We have run out of uh, those. So now we are past uh, system again. That's why I'm saying we're talking about regeneration. We should be talking about regeneration. I think, I think that's a wonderful thought to uh, end with because it is about relooking, rethinking, and especially after the pandemic, a reset. So this could also be that conducive moment in which we all reflect within as to what our priorities should be, not just for ourselves, but also the organizations and the places that we are associated with in contributing to this uh, you know, larger goal. Because I was, I was honestly very, uh, very uh, emo like emotionally taken up by Sir David Attenborough's speech because he not only brought in uh, the negativity, in the situation that we're in, but the, the capacity in which humankind also has to turn these events. And this uh, webinar in that sense has been very uh, instrumental in helping us and those who um, are part of uh, this in understanding the scope at which we can. So um, since we have and uh, now I reached our time. Oui, bonjour, and, uh, oui, bonjour, bonjour. Oui, oui, je suis dans ma... Um, uh, J'ai enlevé mon casque. Sorry, okay. <laughs> okay, so since uh, we are now on time to complete, thank you very much to all the panelists who shared their expertise and thank you for the audience for being a part of it. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope we have left you with you. a thought that would stay. Thank you. Thank you, Azara. Thank you, everybody. It was Thank nice you. having you all here. <laughs> And I just wanted to to say um, uh, thank you also from from my end uh, for for your thoughts and how, for having accepted our invitation to to take part in this uh, in this conversation, and also to invite you for the very final session that will take place tomorrow at two thirty p.m. on the role of archaeological museums in the in when facing contested histories and illicit trafficking of cultural goods. So a whole new topic. Uh, and for this, we will be hosting Sophie Delpierre, who's the head of the Heritage Protection Department of the International Council of Museums, ICOM, Jagat Virasinghe, who's the director of the Postgraduate Institute of Archaeology at the University of Kedanea, Ashley DeVos, a senior architect and conservator, and Catherine Barra, who is an archaeologist, operations and research officer at uh, INRAP, the National Institute of Preventive Archaeological Research. So thank you, thank you all, thank you everyone, and uh, I've learned a lot. And thank you, Azara, for moderating this. Thank and uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.